A long time ago, someone recommended I do a video about this band, and I didn't really know anything about the band, so I kind of put it off. Hopefully you're still around if you requested this video. But now that I'm done with the researching and the writing of it, I'm really glad I dug into them. Missing Persons were a band that helped launch the MTV generation, and they had a really interesting sound and aesthetic, and it's just a fascinating band to dig into. So, this is the story of Missing Persons. This is the story of a group of friends who created some really interesting music before it all fell apart. If you end up enjoying this video, please consider giving it a like, subscribe so you don't miss more stories like this from music history, and if you want to help me decide what I cover next, I do have memberships open on this channel, so I'll be posting polls for members to vote on the next topic I cover, the next band I cover, so if that sounds interesting to you as well as getting like early access to the videos, if that matters at all, then click the link in the description, become a member you'll get access to that perk. You can decide for yourself if you think that's worth it. Personally, I'm not sure I would, but you know, maybe down the line, I'll be able to do better perks. So right now, that's the ones we got. Dale Consolvi, who was named after her father, was born in Massachusetts in 1955. And she fell in love with soul music, listening to people like Curtis Mayfield and the Dramatics, though she did say she eventually got into people like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, kind of like everyone else did at the time. She told North Coast Music Beat, quote, if it's not soul music, I'm not listening to music because I like to dance, end quote. She said her love of poetry came from her mother who would read poets to her, people like Edna Millay, and she fell in love with that lyrical style of writing. That is until her mother cheated on her father and her father put out a contract on her mother's life or something. She said a lot of her songwriting was fueled by personal pain, like seeing her father so heartbroken about her mother leaving and other things that happened in her young life. As a teenager, she started getting into acting. She even studied theater at Emerson College when she was just 16. Her father owned a furniture store, and he hung a photo of Dale in his store and told people that she wanted to be a model, which is something she actually did. Eventually, she became a bunny at the Playboy Club in Boston, and she even posed for Hustler at one point. She said that when she was 16, she snuck through a window into the backstage area of a Frank Zappa concert, and she got to meet him that way, even driving him home after the show, or back to the hotel, I guess. But if you've ever read or watched any Dale interviews, you'll know that her storytelling is a little bit scattered, and I'm not sure that I can 100% believe everything that she says when she tells these stories. In 1976, she headed to Los Angeles for the first time to meet with Hugh Hefner. She had an interview to have some sort of larger role within Playboy. I've seen some reports say that she didn't get the job, but I think she said that she did and she turned it down and headed back to Boston. I'm not sure if this was on that same trip, but she also claims that when she was 21, she fell out of an upper story window in a hotel in downtown LA when someone was chasing her and she spent several weeks in a coma on Frank Zappa's couch. She said, quote, the fallout of the window was monumental because I woke up in Frank Zappa's living room and Moon was playing the harp and Gail, his wife, was by my side. I had just fallen 40 feet out of the window. I was in a coma for two weeks in Frank's living room. Frank was in Japan with Terry Bozio and Gail took care of me. I woke up two weeks into it and I was only awake for a short amount of time. End quote. She said she was put on life support and shipped, was her word, back to the East Coast to recover with her mother. She talked about how hard that experience was, and dealing with recovery took a really long time, and it was really draining for her. After getting a little bit better, Frank took her out on the road touring Europe, and that's when missing persons really started to get together. Whether or not that story is real, it seems like a crazy thing to make up, especially how passionate she sounds when she talks about it, but whether or not that's real, we do know that Frank Zappa hired her to play Mary in his rock opera, Joe's Garage, and that's how she first started getting some attention for her singing ability. It's also how she met Terry Bozio, who was working as a drummer for Frank Zappa. Terry was born in San Francisco in 1950 and started playing makeshift drum sets when he was six years old, but by 13, after seeing the Beatles play on the Ed Sullivan show, he realized that being a musician was something you could actually do, and he started to take drum lessons. In college, he continued to study percussion, and he got to work with and learn from some really talented drummers. 
By the early 70s, Terry was playing in different jazz groups and different clubs in Southern California before he heard about Frank Zappa having auditions in 1975, so he flew himself down to LA. He had actually never heard any of Frank's music before the audition, so he bought three albums in order to hear the songs and kind of learn some of them before going to audition to be in the band. He said, quote, I didn't sleep for three days because the record scared me to death. The sheer volume of memorization was frightening, and then the level of players, end quote. Apparently, his audition was so good that none of the other drummers there wanted to audition after him, so he got the gig, even though he still wasn't entirely convinced that he would be good enough to do it. Towards the end of the 70s, Frank kind of pushed him to branch out and try his own thing, so he joined bands like UK and the Brecker Brothers, but by 1980, all of those bands had kind of petered out a little bit. Terry met Dale through Frank Zappa and immediately fell in love with her. They got married in 1979, so she became Dale Bozio. Terry said that during his time in the band UK, people started comparing his music to bands like Yes and groups like that that he wasn't really influenced by at all. Instead, Terry and Dale were getting really influenced by the punk revolution that was happening in the mid to late 70s. So, kind of wanting to be a part of that, Terry and Dale started their own group. To fill out the group, they turned to Warren Kukurulu, and I know I might be pronouncing that name wrong, I'm sorry, I looked it up, couldn't really hear anyone saying it, so... I gave it the best shot I could. But they met Warren while they were recording the album Joe's Garage for Frank Zappa. Warren grew up in Brooklyn as the oldest of four children, and he started playing both drums and guitar at a really early age. As a teenager, he fell super in love with Frank Zappa's music and started traveling to every show he possibly could. After playing on stage with Frank a couple of times, he was invited to audition to be a part of the live band. He so impressed Frank that he was invited in to work on the albums as well. Through working on Joe's Garage, Warren started writing songs with Dale, and eventually they convinced Harry to start a new band with them that they originally called U.S. Drag. In 1980, the band that was now called Missing Persons got together to record a four-song EP that was largely financed by Warren's dad, and then they started playing some shows to support that EP. Though Dale did say that they spent that first year as a band basically eating tuna sandwiches to survive and rehearsing all the time. But once they started playing, they got really good positive attention almost immediately in Los Angeles, becoming one of the most in-demand live bands. Bands. Eventually, that little EP hit number 46, and it got them enough attention to get them a little movie spot in like a comedy underground movie called Lunch Wagon that, according to Terry at least, they recorded when they were completely unknown, but by the time it came out, they were actually kind of a big name, so it was just this weird, like, embarrassing thing for them where they were like, oh, we're kind of not happy we did that now that we're like actually popular dale talked about the typical songwriting process for the group she said quote terry would take the guitar and suggest that we write a song and play warren would sit down sometimes and play the drums and then terry would play the piano a lot of times it came from a spontaneous idea or phrase or stream of consciousness but 1982 was when the band really found some success they added chuck wilde as a keyboardist and patrick o'hearn as a bassist chuck wilde grew up in kansas city and started studying music from the age of four eventually getting to study at the kansas city conservatory of music when he was still in high school he then spent four years in the navy before deciding to focus on music getting a start playing in different blues and rock bands in the 70s before finding himself in Missing Persons. Patrick O'Hearn was born in Los Angeles, but he grew up in the Portland area where he first started playing in nightclubs as a teenager and joined the Musicians Union, so he was pretty serious really early on. That probably is because his parents were actually working musicians and he got to start playing in their lounge band. He moved to Seattle in 1972 after he graduated high school where he took private lessons from a bass player and briefly went to college. By 1973, he had moved to San Francisco where he plugged into the really vibrant jazz community there, which is where he first met Terry Bozio. In 1976, he got an audition to play for Frank Zappa, so that's how he met the rest of the people and got invited into Missing Persons. In 1982, Missing Persons were really riding that new wave, and they signed with Capitol Records, who basically immediately re-released their EP. With major label support, that EP sold several hundred thousand more copies, and it let them go into the studio to start working on their debut full-length album. That album, called Spring Session M, released in October of 1982, and it was a big success. 
eventually going gold. It peaked at number 17, and critics were generally pretty impressed with it. They released four singles from the album, all of which charted, largely because they got significant airplay on MTV. In 1982, MTV was still pretty new and untrusted by the music industry in general. It had only really been around for like a year, and labels weren't quite sure what to think of it yet. They were a little hesitant to give this TV channel their songs and their music. But pretty soon, it caught fire, and any song that got regular airplay on MTV became a major hit. And Missing Persons seemed like they were created for MTV. With a vibrant, quirky aesthetic, and poppy, new-sounding songs, and a singer who seemed to be trying to be eye candy, they were made for TV. I mean, Dale wore a plexiglass see-through bra on stage that she would sometimes fill with water and live goldfish. She said it would sometimes take her up to two hours to get ready for a performance. I mean, how would that not look super eye-catching on MTV? Dale said about her aesthetic decisions, quote, I would go into the hardware store and find whatever I could to get attention. I would wear plexiglass and plastics on stage. We weren't taking no for an answer back then, and no one was going to tell me what to do. End quote. She also said at the time, quote, I like bizarre outfits made from plastics and materials not normally used in clothes design. My attire is not meant to be deliberately outrageous. End quote. Missing Persons was also a band that helped bridge that divide between the new synth pop of the early 80s and the more rock sound of Frank Zappa in the 70s. Most of them had played really extensively with Frank, so they knew how to play that rockier, edgy sound. But Chuck Wilde was a super talented keyboardist who helped them develop that synth-pop sound. It was just a really interesting mix of different styles back when a lot of bands weren't necessarily doing that yet most of them would eventually. At the start, they didn't have much competition on MTV, and they held that audience in the palm of their hand. Dale talked about the influence MTV had on their career. She said, quote, We had to figure out what we were going to portray visually and musically. Oh my god, that's a lot to think about. In the world today, they are half visual, half music. End quote. They released their next album, Rhyme and Reason, in 1984, and it was kind of a letdown. Did not perform well commercially. They still did get airplay on MTV, but by that point, labels had clocked on to the power of MTV, and they faced stiffer competition. The tour in support of that album was still pretty successful, largely on the back of their fascinating aesthetic, but I think some of the charm might have been wearing off of missing persons. I think people were starting to see them as a trend instead of a fresh new sound, even if they were kind of pioneers of that fresh new sound that was really catching fire. Also, Chuck Wilde left the group in 1985, and that played a pretty large role in changing their sound. So feeling like they were on the rocks and in danger of being dropped by their label, they felt like they needed to really put out a smash hit album. So they worked with Bernard Edwards, who was a producer for bands like Chic, to try and position them as superstars again. With Bernard, they released Color In Your Life in 1986, and it was another rather disappointing album, and the short tour and support of it was chaotic to say the least. In an interview, Dale kind of broke down the different attitudes behind recording their three albums. She said they made that first album when they were all friends making music they were excited about and loved making. In the second album, they were trying to make an impression and stand out in the music world. The third album, they were trying to make a hit so they could keep the label happy and not get dropped. Most of the band weren't happy at that point. The tensions were mounting, especially between Dale and Terry. And then one weekend, at least according to Dale, Dale and Warren hooked up, which kind of spelled the end of Missing Persons. Dale said, quote, Drugs, sex, and rock and roll, that's what happened. We crashed and banged and fell apart. And all of that work and all of that time just went down the drain. End quote. Terry said about the breakup, quote, For what it's worth, we had our 15 minutes. It was kind of like a Polini movie. It just couldn't last. You've seen all of the behind the music situations and Spinal Tap, and that's kind of what it was like. End quote. Terry and Dale got divorced, and as you might expect, the band split up at basically the same time. Dale had also met Prince and allegedly had an affair with him, so he was pushing her to branch out and start her own solo project. In recent interviews, she's taken a lot of the blame for the band splitting up, essentially saying that she quit and she can understand why the other 
members in the band thought that she walked out on them and forgot about them. After the breakup, Warren went on to play with Duran Duran and have quite a lot of success with them. Terry continued to be one of the best drummers in rock, working with people like Jeff Beck and Mick Jagger. He mostly works as a session and tour drummer. Chuck Wilde started making relaxation music under the name Liquid Mind and has been nominated for an Emmy for his work making music for TV. Patrick O'Hearn got with former Duran Duran guitarist Andy Taylor and former Sex Pistols guitarist Steve Jones for a short project, which is kind of a crazy group, and then launched his own solo career. Dale started a solo career at the prompting of Prince, where she became known as simply Dale. Her first solo album was released on Prince's label in 1988, and since then she's kept working on her own solo stuff to varying degrees of success. In 2001, the original trio did reunite for a little bit, mostly as a promotional thing and a few performances, but by 2002 and 2003, Warren and Dale had reunited without Terry for a few shows, but but not a whole lot came out of those shows. 2011, Warren and Dale once again restarted the group without Terry, this time for a larger tour. As of 2014, the band is still kind of active, but Dale is really the only official member. Dale has said in recent interviews that she knows Terry wishes her the best and hopes for success in her musical career, but the band doesn't talk anymore. She seems like she's enjoying what she's currently doing, but still feels kind of sad that she's lost her friends and these people that she made such an impact with. So that's the story of Missing Persons. Let me know what you think about this group. Did you know about them? I'm guessing you did since you clicked on this video. What did I leave out? What did I miss out on? What should I look further into? It was really fascinating to dig into this group, so leave suggestions below of other bands I should look into. I like doing that even if i can't always get to it i've got a very long list at this point like the video if you liked it subscribe so you won't miss more stories like this and become a member if you want to